we will get started and, and welcome again to a, a Lodi brand live um, wine tasting. Um, tonight we are celebrating Earth Day and we have a couple of fun things in store for you. Um, first being we've got four wines that we're going to be um, tasting that um, are all Lodi Rules uh, certified, which is the Lodi Sustainable Wine Growing Program here in Lodi. And, uh, and then we've taken it to another notch this time and paired those with cheese um, to go with evening. Probably the, the first thing for me to do is actually introduce myself to you since uh, that's usually a good place to start and, and I haven't done that. But some of you know me as, anyways. My name is Stuart Spencer and, and I am uh, work here at the Lodi Wine Grape Commission. Um, I wear many hats here. I won't go into those details. But um, one of the other hats I wear is I'm also the winemaker for my family winery at uh, Samo Winery, which is one of our wines this evening as well. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Cindy Della Monica, who uh, is the proprietor of one of the best shops in town called Cheese Central. And uh, she's going to be our cheese expert this evening. So, Cindy, so actually, do you want to tell us just a little bit about your background, how you got to be in a cheese monger? Right. Well, um, uh, the short version, uh, self-taught, uh, excellent um, family support that helped me learn uh, quite a bit about cooking and all different kinds of cuisine. Um, went from that to starting a catering company. Uh, did that for about 30 years. Owned a restaurant here in town. Uh, when my restaurant closed, I had always been a caterer for uh, Mondavi family in Woodbridge Winery. And when the restaurant closed, we went in and uh, got put on staff. Staff chef there until the constellation group by a family. So there we go. Now I'm Cheese Central. That's my newest venture. Uh, beats heck out of all the dishes. <laughs> I love my cheeses. We have between 80 and 100 cheeses in our shop at any given time. We try to cover our locals as well as um, international cheeses. And pick and choose and change it up uh, probably seasonally is the closest. Cool. It's a, um, it is a great place to visit. We did a, uh, a staff education trip this last uh, December where Cindy Ford right. served a bunch of cheese and, and, and wine for us. And, to drink good pork. Yeah, there are, there are worse ways to spend a work day, that's for sure. Um, but uh, before we dive into the wine and cheese, and, and I'm probably certain some of you have already started, as we have here, uh, but uh, I think it's important to talk a little bit about um, our Sustainable Lodi Rules program since we are celebrating Earth Day and that's the feature of the wines. Um, uh, Sydney gets to be the fun one tonight and talk about cheese, and I get to be the academic one and talk about things like sustainability and standards and all that fun stuff. But uh, one of the things we're really proud of here in Lodi is our sustainable wine growing program. And it's, it's a program that really began back in 1991 when the Lodi Wine Grant Commission was established. And it, it was a program that it really grew from the ground up. And I think that's one of the key fundamentals of our program is that it was a program developed by farmers for farmers uh, and not something that was a top-down approach to, to wine grape growing. And over the years we began that program very simply with what we call tailgate meetings or neighborhood grower meetings where we would introduce uh, sustainable practices uh, to growers at the time. We called them integrated pest management practices. Um, and that program evolved from simple tailgate meetings into what became the Lodi Wine Growers Workbook, which was the first uh, uh, district-wide uh, assessment of sustainable practices produced in California. And that was a comprehensive book uh, where the growers could self-assess themselves. And it became the foundation for the California Sustainable Wine Growers Program. Um, and then in 2005, we launched our Lodi Rules for Sustainable Wine Growing Certification Program. And this was the first of its kind in California uh, to uh, assess and certify uh, sustainable wine growing practices. And we are now celebrating our 10th year of that program. What began as, as six of um, adventurous and growers in about 12 to 1500 acres of grapes has now grown to over 100 growers. Uh, we have uh, 30,000 acres that are certified 
in California, 20,000, about 21,000 of those acres are here in Lodi. We expanded the program to include some areas outside of Lodi, including myself. I have vineyards up in the foothills that we certified in the program as well. And uh, and uh, two years ago, we did a major revision of the of the standards themselves, which was a comprehensive effort where we uh, went through every standard one by one, looked what we'd learned uh, over the years of doing it, and made adjustments and added to it and perfected it and made it more rigorous um, so that we can you know, continue to improve ourselves and our farming, farming practices. And uh, that program has um, been critically acclaimed and it's being modeled throughout, throughout the world. Um, it's um, it's something, like I said, we're very proud of. There's now in our, our farming practices, there's, there's two components to the certification model, and, and I won't bore you too much here, and we'll dive into the wines pretty quickly here, because I know I'm thirsty, and I'm sure everyone else is, but there's two major components to the certification system. The first is the, the practices, and uh, that is where there are 101 farming practices that you have to go through and audit yourself, and you go through and assess yourself and uh, record what you're doing and what you're not doing. Uh, and then the second component is a pesticide um, assessment system, which basically you have to um, record and report all the um, inputs into your vineyard from pesticides, both organic and synthetic, and those are scored on a complex model, and you have to fall below a certain threshold as well. Now, where we like to separate our program is it's not only um, a third-party audit where, where an independent auditor comes in and uh, assesses your records to make sure you're doing exactly what you're doing, but it also is third-party accredited. And by that, uh, when we developed our standards, these are sent out to an organization called Protect the Harvest, which uh, then sends the standards out to academics, environmental groups, and others to go through the standards, vet them, and accredit them. And uh, we feel that layer of detail is important to lending credibility to what we're doing here, which ultimately is an effort to, uh, to uh, you know, explain and communicate to consumers what it is we do in the business. Uh, and then the key, you know, from a consumer standpoint is we developed the certified green seal that's now on the bottles of wine you see. So if you turn all your bottles of wine around and you've got this evening, somewhere on there is the certified green water rules for sustainable wine growing seal. Uh, yeah. The acquiesce one is, is the smallest. So, um, I think now is a great time to jump into the wines because because um, we're thirsty. Because we're thirsty. <laughs> and I'm tired of talking, but I've got 51 minutes left to go. So. <laughs> but um, so the evening's wines are kind of an eclectic mix, also. And uh, the first one I'd like you guys to all pour a glass and um, is from Aquias Winery, which is one of our relatively Cindy's like, why don't you give me a glass? Yeah. <laughs> Aquias is uh, one of our newer wineries here in Lodi, and it's um, dedicated solely to white wines. Now, many of you that are somewhat new to Lodi may wonder, think of Lodi and, and red wine, but Lodi does quite a bit of white wines, and, and, and uh, Sue Tipton, the proprietor for uh, Aquias, is proving that Lodi can make very delicate, uh, refreshing white wines. Um, Sue, or not Sue, Cindy, I know. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you tell us uh, the cheese you chose to pair with this evening's wine? So one of the, the uh, cheese pickers that we like a lot is the uh, Cypress Grove Creamery up in Arcadia, California. We, we carry several of their cheeses as well as their little flashback assorted little goat's cheeses that are flavored and what have you. One of the ones I really enjoy is our Midnight Moon. We get a lot of people who like to come for that one as well. It's a terrific cheese that is a 100% pasteurized goat's milk gouda. It's made with a vegetarian rennet. The uh, cheese itself um, is actually produced as part of the Cream Line program that uh, Cypress Grove set up 
to help expand on their facilities. The cheese itself is made in Holland, but the appanage is uh, done here in California. Uh, Mary Keene, the uh, founder of Cypress Grove, was very careful to interview and find um, a producer in Holland that would echo or mirror her sustainable uh, and uh, business practices that her uh, cheeses are produced here in California with. Uh, it was funny, I, in some of my research I found a video that she did as an interview with Whole Foods Markets, I think it was 2010. And she said, you know, we've done made these cheeses since the 1980s, and everyone told me I needed it as part of my business practices to put down a mission statement. And uh, she had never done that. She says, I already knew in my gut just what it is I wanted to do, but she never really had a written statement. So for this um, interview that she did, she wrote or, or spoke about a mission statement, and she said, uh, we want to provide our customers with an innovative selection of unique and exceptional cheeses all the while taking care of our customers, our community, and our environment. And that's exactly where her focus has always been. The cheese itself is um, has a floral or sweet aroma to it. I love the kind of pinkish ivory blush that the uh, cheese paste has. Um, it is terrific with anything that has a lemon base to it. So say a lemon zest cracker, um, if you grate the cheese and we were putting them on little baguettes with a little lemon pear marmalade and grilling them. That's awfully tasty. Um, exactly. Got a lemon jalapeno jam that's kind of nice to go with it as well. A little bit. But it, it seemed to me that it brought out a really nice uh, bit of the citrusy and floral of this particular wine. Good. I, I would agree. Um, just a little background um, on Peak Pool Blog. I'm, I'm a bit of a great geek. And and, uh, but this is a variety that, that is relatively new to me. And there's not a lot of it grown in California. It does come from the south of France, and uh, uh, Thomas Creek was one that brought this variety of these clones into, into California. And uh, Sue Tipton, you know, initially focused her, her winery on white grown varieties and uh, had to get this people. I think she only has about 100, 100 vines growing at her, at her winery here in Lodi, which is just um, just on the south side of Peltier Road, so I think it still sits just inside the um, Colby River ABA. Uh, it's fairly sandy soils there. Um, the variety is known as a fairly, um, for having good acidity to it too, which I think makes a uh, white variety well suited in Lodi. One of the things <coughs> we're seeing in Lodi this day from a winemaking perspective is a growing interest in kind of lighter style whites and I think this is a perfect example of it. I think it clocks in at about 12.5% alcohol. Um, as Jenny just tweeted out, there's only 98 cases made and so you group of bloggers got 2% of the whole production this evening. So uh, about two cases went to this evening's tasting. Sue has actually managed to, I think, plant some more, more grapes um, of this peak pool blanc because she's had such a uh, resounding demand and success with it that hopefully we'll see a few more, a few more vines and wines down the road from it. Um, my guess, though, is, is I'm not sure if anyone else is growing it in Lodi right now, um, but based upon her success with it and what this wine is showing, I'm sure there will be a few more growers. We get quite a few people who come from her tasting room, which is just a gorgeous tasting room too, who come to the counter and ask what else can we put with it, and there's a wide variety of cheeses that do work very, very well with this wine, uh, including our second cheese, so if you have an opportunity to take a bite or two, taste that with it as well. But the uh, uh, wine is very refreshing, her, uh, all of her whites are just beautiful. We did a direct pairing of cheeses with all of her whites about a year, a year and a half ago. We have a complete list in our shop of the things that she likes with her. I'm just savoring the wine for a second. Good job, take your time. Yeah, I, I, it's got nice floral aromas to it. That's pretty nice. Um, not too much problem to it, but it's, it's just a delicate, light wine. Um, the other thing it highlights, too, I think, with what we're seeing here in Lodi, is we have now over 101 varieties in production. Um, it is one of the few, um, 
uh, we're seeing a growing interest in all these kind of alternative Mediterranean varieties that are really kind of a nice home in our, our warm climate here. So, uh, and she can do that successfully. We will hopefully see more from, from her. This vineyard is also, she, uh, her vineyard manager, farms her vineyards under the Lodi Rules program as well. And um, it is certified sustainable. I think she's been doing that almost since day one. My guess is she's probably at about her third or fourth vintage to produce. So it's got to be, got to be at least fourth, if not fifth. I met her just before she opened, and our shop was just opening at the same time over four years old. So either four or five. Yeah, I, it's all blurred to me. No, <laughs> I'm five. It does, it does go by quickly. So, um, but it, it is, um, it is a delightful wine. Back on the Lodi Rules Program, the certification program, you know, our standards are broken down into chapters. One of the things we look at too is, is you know, ecosystem management. So it's not just worrying about what is in, what is going on in your vine rows. It's about worrying about what's going on in your whole range. So that involves, you know, getting points and assessment for things like putting in hedgerows, involves that things were creating habitat for both, you know, beneficial insects as well as other wildlife that may be in and around your vineyards. And, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's something that separates, separates our program from others. But and it's also something that I think kind of ties in with the, the heritage and the family nature of our, our growers. You know, many of them live in the vineyards. They raise their kids in the vineyards. There. They were raised in vineyards, and so when you grow up, and this is your backyard. You want to treat it with respect. Right. Um, and they, there is a, uh, a kind of quiet environmentalism that kind of permeates some of our growers in the community, and they take pride in taking care of their vineyards in this manner. And uh, Gonzo says there's no need to chill the hell out of it uh, unless you trample something so delicate. <laughs> I would agree. It's, it's a very delightful yeah. wine, and you chill it. You get, get the wines too cold, and they lose some of their uh, their uh, their delightful. What was the question, there, Jenny? Um, from because that I lost it. It disappeared on the screen. For consumers, let's see our region as a, a hot region. How do we um, produce wines with such good acid? Um, good question. Uh, I think you know. I think the first part of that question is they say, how do we produce wines with such good acid when we see it as a hot region? And first of all, Florida is not as hot as many people would perceive it to be. Um, you know, we sit directly east of the San Francisco Bay, and we have these um, very cooling breezes that come through. And what I often tell people is our climate is actually much more moderate here. Because we don't, you know, I farm up in the foothills as well, and, and we tend to have higher highs there in the daytime and, and colder colds at night. And the, the delicacy of the fruit, I think, comes from a moderate climate here. The other thing, too, is this variety is a variety that kind of retains its acidity well. So it does very well in a warmer climate, climate like Lodi. Um, two, uh, you know, when you're picking your wines, too, and this, this one I think was picked in early August, uh, you know, fairly low sugar, potential alcohol, so you get, um, you get, uh, I would see it too. Was it early picking last year for her? Was it picking up? I don't know when she picked this last year, per se, relative to the previous years, but I can say that, you know, 2014 was an earlier year. Yeah, yeah and um, I think, you know, a lot of the whites like this were picked in early to mid August. Uh, and we're on track for another early year here in 2015, too, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Unless we have another year. Yes, we don't need any more. No more hailstorms, so. Well, I love the acidity of this and perfect with lots of food. I look at this as a terrific wine with food, just from the chef side of my business. But for the cheese side, I liked how the uh, smoothness uh, and the sweetness of this cheese toned down a little bit of the acidity in the wine and paired with it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed that combination without um, oh, overshadowing. You'll find on that piece of midnight moon that you'll get a really kind of a darker line down at the end of the uh, cheese paste where the wax uh, layer is, and that'll have a little bit stronger flavor than the middle portion of your uh, 
Well, unfortunately, Cliff can't hear us or see us very well, but at least he has the cheese and wine, so hopefully he's enjoying them. Um, yeah, that was really nice. Um, I think we'll move on to wine number two and cheese number two. And uh, this, the wine number two this evening is the Oak Farm North Fry Ranch 2014 Sauvignon Blanc. So Oak Farm is one of our newer wineries here in Lodi, a uh, beautiful property at the uh, north end of uh, Davis or Green's Road, and uh, the old ranch, and uh, it was actually built there and opened the winery just this fall. Their first uh, uh, kind of open harvest, harvest with the new winery. They've been producing wines now for a couple of years, um, but um, the uh, so they're probably three or four vintages into it. And this is their, their uh, first year with the, the new tasting room and winery production facility. Beautiful, gorgeous uh, Um so the, the wine, um, this is the, actually the first time they've made this wine, and it comes from uh, Morfry Ranch, which is was one of the first growers to adopt the sustainable program back in um, 2005. And so they, they first certified their own Zinfandel vineyards, which my family gets grapes from for our Zinfandels. This uh, Sauvignon Blanc sits almost uh, directly next to um, our Marion's vineyard, Old Vine Zinfandel, which is 100 14 year old vineyard, and then some of you want obviously a newer planting just in the south, but very sandy, sandy soils. Uh, why don't you, Cindy, tell us about the cheese that you chose for the soft and So the cheese is uh, Humboldt Fog. It is the flagship cheese of Cypress Grove's Creamery, and was uh, one that I, I just love because the story. I'll be as brief as I can about the story. I'm the mother of twins. I'm a son and had uh, twin daughters. So when I heard the story of Mary Keene and her children, she's a single mom of four girls, um, she decided that uh, in order to provide really good clean milk and make uh, yogurt and ice cream and butter and so forth for her children, she wanted to get some goats. So a neighbor told her, you know, hey, you can catch one and you can have one of my goats. Uh, when Mary offered to purchase one. So she got a couple of goats and started breeding those. Um, her uh, food produced from the uh, goats was wonderful, but she didn't know how to make cheese. And at the time, there wasn't any no books. There was no American cheeses that were of uh, goat origin. Everything you got was French at that time. So uh, lucky girl, I wish I had thought about this earlier. She called up her mom and said, uh, hey, hang on to the girls for a bit. I found an internship in France. I'm going to learn how to make cheese. I wish I had thought of that first. <laughs> so she uh, learned how to make cheese, and one of her favorite cheeses in France is called Mornier. Wonderful cow's milk washed brown cheese that has a gray ash line that runs through the middle. So you notice in your sample, it's a beautiful white cheese with a bloomy rind on the outside. Right underneath the bloom or uh, the velvet of the rind is going to be an ash layer, along with a thin ash line that runs through the center. And this cheese uh, was modeled after the Mornier of France, which is about an 800-year-old recipe. Um, the ash in the Mornier is a production method of making sure that the cheese uh, will keep overnight during a course of two milkings during the day to make this wonderful cheese. The Humboldt Fog, however, is done only as a single milking and with the uh, decorative ash line. It is not there for production method. The ash, I found out, was uh, made of white pine ash. Um, it's combined with sea salt and is something that is very uh, uh, no, no value in flavor. It's there for decoration only. So your sample should be very ripe and lovely. It should be very chalky white to the middle. It has a lovely gray ash line and then this wonderful gooey ripened portion of the goat's milk cheese uh, right inside of the rind. All three layers should be eaten at the same time. You get wonderful textures out of all of them. The flavor is spectacular. How do you like it with the so far? I freaking love it. I knew you would. I I I think it's delicious. This is my kind of cheese, and uh, you know, point of clarification here: 
camera did this face thing last year. Yes, he did. And he got fired because he won't be crying. <laughs> so I, 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 I took him under my wing. He is now a rind eater. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he's, he's a weak rind eater. <laughs> But no, I, in, all, in all honesty, I uh, actually I love this cheese. It's absolutely delicious. I think it goes very well with the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and uh, a little bit more on the wine too. Um, you know the style. Chad Joseph is the winemaker at Oak Farm, and Chad Joseph is also uh, the consulting winemaker for Harney Lane here in Lodi and uh, Nancy Coyote, and he's also in the, the Lodi Native Group making. He's a very talented winemaker and very vested in Lodi. Um, the interesting thing with this, this wine, too, is the style he's going for, I think, is very well suited for Lodi. It's, it's kind of a light and refreshing style. It, it was bottled very young. Uh, this wine was picked in, in mid August as well. Why it still had that nice, fresh acidity. Um, and he said, you know, it sounds cliche, you know, but. It, the wine tastes, tastes like what we were tasting in the vineyard, and, uh, and I agree. Yeah, and so he basically said he, you know, he took on a very kind of reductive approach to the winemaking with it, which basically by limiting the oxygen content and exposure, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, pressing it whole cluster, you know, bringing it in a tank, fermenting it very cool, and just not messing with it. It was bottled in early December, which is fairly early, and, and I think one of the comments was on was on the, the little bit of CO2 in there, a little bit of a little, um, uh, yeah, a little effervescence, kind of a little tingle to it. And you get that when you're bottling some of these wines earlier, because there's still some bound up CO2 from fermentation. But I think it adds a real freshness and liveliness to this wine. It goes goes well um, goes well with the, uh, the cheese. I've been asked to uh, answer how we go about creating the pairings. Uh, one of the things that we do is, um, at this time, I think over the course of our four years in Lodi, we've had lots of eating and drinking. <laughs> <laughs> <And> volunteers. <laughs> we have uh, paired up with uh, 22 of our local wineries. At this time, they've brought in their wines to wine cheese shop. And we sit down at my back table. I know it's a dirty job. Somebody has to do it, they say. And uh, the wines are placed in front of me. I know which ones they're bringing ahead of time. So I'll pull a variety of cheeses that I think may go with that style of wine. And we actually will sit down and spend about two hours coming up with the best pairing of uh, the wine and the cheese together. Of course, every vintage is going to be a little bit different each time you're bottled. Uh, you know, some you'll want today may not be the same next year. So it's, you know, we might have to revisit once in a while, but typically we do a pretty good job of finding what our customers will enjoy as they're traveling through our Appalachian and tasting the wine. So the winemaker or the tasting room manager will come and help me out, and we get a really good, nice listing of what goes with what. We had a good time with Chad Joseph one time. We were doing a, a blues pairing for Carney Lane Winery Wine Club. Had a good time with those wines and blues. That was a tough one. Yeah, <laughs> you guys do a fair bit of wine and okay. cheese pairings out at Hardy Lane. Huh? We we are their March Wine Club event. Um, have been since we've opened, and uh, look forward to doing more of that. But we do a lot of the wine club events for a variety of wineries because it is a, a fun thing to do. People love their cheese. Yeah. People love the eat. They love the drink. love their cheese. <laughs> And I think on that note, I'm going to have another piece of the cheese, and, and I'm going to get a nice hunk of the rind here, despite Cameron. You have a really nice food. I'm eating the rind right now. Good job, Cameron. Jenny's quiet over there. You eat it too, Jen? <laughs> We're oh. teaching Cameron to eat rind. Wow, I love that. Another fun, I was going to let you to <laughs> get through your cheese. Uh, another fun pairing of this uh, cheese, um, not just with the wine, but on your t at the table. Honey, nuts, certainly all of those go very well with it. We carry uh, Spanish quince paste to put in Rio in our uh, shop. We love that with it as well. The sweet and salty go very well together. 
Um, people talk about having the humble frog on the spinach salad with you know, cranberries and candy pecans, what have you. Well, the Vibrio with the cheese goes very much like the cranberries do in the salad. Mm -hmm. So I leave behind the spinach and just concentrate on the fruit and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, dilute it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of a good philosophy. Yeah, there you go. Got to uh, think outside the box. <laughs> one, of the, one of the questions is, how is the drought affecting Lodi, and are you farming differently? Um, you know, the drought is top of mind of, of all growers and farmers, no matter, no matter where you are. Um, we are fortunate here in, in Lodi in that um, you know, we have good right, water rights and resources available. I think, um, you know, one of the things, you know, Part of our whole sustainability program, our certification program, is, is water management is a key element of that. And in that system, you know, there there are a lot of things that we get points for with efficient and effective use of water. And so, you know, with that, you know, there's things like um, drip irrigation. The, the region over the last 20 to 25 years has gone from basically furrow irrigating or flood irrigating their vineyards to drip irrigation, which uses less water and more efficient use of water. You need to, in the system, you need to, you know, test your your uh, your pumps for efficiency. You need to test your irrigation lines for efficiency. You, you, you need to do that on a regular basis. You need to check your lines for to make sure there's no no holes and things like that. I think um, um, you know it'll be seen. You know what's going to happen with the drought. A lot depends on the timing of the water we do get too. Last year, for example, in 2014, we were fortunate the water we did get came in in the in the um, late spring. So we had a fairly wet April and May, and so that gave a lot of you know, available water to the vines to grow early in the season. Um, but this year we, we haven't seen that yet. The water we got was mostly back in, in late November and December. So uh, it's something you know we're, we're concerned about and then hopefully hopefully we get some rain here to get sort themselves out. But in the meantime, uh, we need to have this effectively and efficiently as we can. One of the other things we've actually done here in Lodi, you can how to get a little bit more on viticulture. Um, early on our research department here funded a bunch of research with regulated deficit irrigation too. And one of the things we learned is that by controlling um, controlling the water the vines are giving you can have uh, incredible impacts on the wine quality. You can control the rate of the vines in, in more irrigated areas like we have here. And a lot of that comes down to that period of time between between Eurasian, uh, well between set and Eurasian, when, when the grapes first set their berries and then they start to the water use during that period of time has a tremendous effect on quality. Uh, but we will keep a, keep a watchful eye on it too. Um, any last questions on the, the Boar Fry or Cook Farm Boar Fry Sauvignon Blanc? I think it was a delightful wine when I was uh, talking, talking with, uh, with Chad today, Joseph the winemaker here. I was told I'm very delighted that they were making the Sauvignon Blanc and more fry. Jerry Fry is the, the grower and more fry ranches have been bugging me and my wine to make the Sauvignon Blanc uh, from from this vineyard and uh, and I'm like, you know what? I've got I've already got one weird night that I'm making. A weird night? Well, it's Verdello. Oh. And um, my customer base is mostly red and so I kind of, you know, politely say no. And uh, but then but he really wanted someone to make a video designated and white out of it. And so uh, so Oak Farm did, which is good to see did a very nice job with it. You know, speaking a little bit about more Fry Ranch too, I think they're one of the more innovative farmers we have here in, in the area and in California in general. Like I said, they were one of the first to get certified in the program. They also, um, in addition to farming I think around 600 acres of grapes. They have nearly 200 acres of old vines in Fidel. This range is about 220 acres. There's, I think, 13 different varieties growing on it and um, eight different old Zinfandel vineyards only going from 1901 to 1945. Uh, and uh, the, 
the um, other thing they do too, which is kind of a unique thing, is they grow heirloom beans. And uh, Jerry got into growing this whole assortment of heirloom dried beans, and they're the most beautiful looking things I've ever seen. I love <laughs> cooking with them. And you can make a gorgeous one day just out of them. Yeah. Oh, they're and there's like eight, eight, 18 or so, 20 different varieties of heirloom beans he grows with all these unusual names and things like that too. So they really are uh, a family farm. They've been farming here in California 150 years. Started out over in the Bay Area, moved to, to Rhode Island in the 60s. Uh, and I count them as my very first catering customer. Really? When I started more than 30 years ago, they were my very, very first catering customer. Uh, I've just been called a goddess, by the way. A cheese goddess. I like it. You can go see me anytime from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to ship you cheese? Call me. I ship cheese all over the country. We shipped from Hawaii to Alaska, all the way to Florida. Back to Florida package left last week. It was pretty fun. Call me anytime. Yeah, I see Luscious Luscious just stained her carpet with Tanat. Um, <laughs> oh, no. We're not on that one yet. We're not on that one, I'm but I managed to, I didn't get some on my shirt when I was pre-tasting, you know, because we always have to pre-taste. That's what we do. Good job. We're professionals. Um, so, uh, I think we'll move next on to uh, my wine, which is the 2013 uh, St. Amon Barbera uh, Levantini Vineyard. And, um, I need to grab a glass of this. I think some of our, our friends have already moved on. They're, they're enjoying the wine and the cheese and maybe listening to us. So. My dad was an early wine aficionado way back when it wasn't you know, something to do I mean, in the 60s. One of my favorite wines that he picked was the Barbera. And uh, I drank it for about, I don't know, five, six years. Uh, and then it wasn't available much anymore. It kind of disappeared. So I was real happy to see first. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, a couple of questions popped up here. One, um, did I get any? Did we get any hail damage in our vineyards? And, and uh, in the vineyards that I source grapes from, no, we did it. But for those that aren't aware, there was a pretty nasty hail storm that went through uh, Lodi about two weeks ago, yeah. and um, it just did this weird kind of diagonal path from basically. Highway 12, north through Lodi, across Woodridge Road, and, yeah, and a few vineyards that were hit were just, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it was, um, they were stripped almost to just the steps in there. I think the most part of it, you know, in a totality sense, Lodi would be fine, but those vineyards that were hit by it were hit pretty hard. Um, another question, what's the RS on the Barbera? It's just a little under 0.4, right around 0.4. But um, backing up to the wine, um, you know, I said Jerry probably was bugging me to make a Sauvignon Blanc. Well, back in the 90s, Ted Levantine, the, the farmer of this vineyard, was bugging my, my dad and I to, to make a Barbera from his vineyard. It was a 10 acre vineyard planted in 1972. And, um, and uh, you know, we were, we were declining because we made a bunch of other oddball stuff. We didn't need another kind of oddball. At that point in time, there weren't many wineries in Lodi, and Barbera is a lesser known variety. So, but then he ended up cooking at my wedding, mm -hmm. and we're kind of obligated to make wine from it. So, we made a wine in 1998 and sold out in three months, won a bunch of awards, and so we've kind of been doing it ever since. But um, it's actually kind of a funky old vineyard. Like I said, it was planted in '72. Uh, it's just in the um, J. Hunt ABA of the Lodi Appalachian, which is uh, just north of, of the city of Lodi. This vineyard is actually right across the freeway from the parachute center, so as I'm out there field, field sampling during our, uh, getting close to harvest, you can see that the parachute is kind of floating down to the ground. Um, our bear's variety, I think, is very well suited for Lodi. It, uh, it retains the city very well. I have some great low tannin. And the Lodi, you get this beautiful fruit presentation to it. The, um, the challenge with, uh, with, um, with Barbera, actually, Lodi, sometimes it can be too acidic, which is kind of good, runs contrary to what you would think. Um, why Julia's asking, is Barbera widely grown in Lodi? And, and there's, I think, um, you know, maybe 500 to 1,000 tons left in Lodi. This vineyard was originally planted for a Gallo Hardy Burgundy of all things back in the early, 
early 70s, um, Gallo did a big push and they planted, um, planted they were encouraging growers to plant Barbera, Petit Syrah, Zinfandel, and Carrot, which are all kind of base varieties in the heart of Burgundy. Almost like we're all in Barbera, which Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyways, so why don't, you, why don't you tell us about the cheese you chose for this? No worries. Um, what I love about this uh, cheese is that it reminds me of very young Parmigiano. It is locally produced. This is a wonderful uh, producer in our area, um, in Modesto, the Episcopalini Farms. They are um, located on property that was purchased more than 100 years ago for their dairy um, by the grandfather of the current uh, dairyman. Mm -hmm. And his uh, children, adult children, are running the farm. They make farmstead artisan cheeses. And the artisan cheeses uh, that they make are fantastic. This is the very first one that they started with. It's called Samuel King Gold. It is something to um, honor our uh, Samuel King Valley, very fertile area where they are located. All of their uh, farm products that they grow are organic. The uh, practices with their animals are spectacular. They are fully organic, no our best in their animals, but they did not go for uh, official certification. Uh, it's one of their choices in this family, but they are the highest quality milk. It shows up in their cheese. San Joaquin Gold is a very large wheel, and it has a very thin rind on the outside. You'll notice it on yours. Um, the rind is edible, whether you like the, the texture or not is up to you. But this cheese may have some of the fine little crystals in it too. Um, for sustainability, uh, they're just amazing. They were one of the first to have a methane digester. So all of their uh, production uh, in their offices, their facilities, and the dairy are run on the electricity produced by their methane digester. It's pretty interesting. I'm not sure how to transition from a methane digester into wine, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try and figure that out. Talking so. about sustainability here. <laughs> I was, I was re reading questions as they were coming through. Uh -huh. it, was, it was starting to move quickly, and, and one of the questions was um, the original source. I think when they're asking for the cuttings of this wood, I, I don't know. Um, you know, the, and I don't know if the farmer does. I probably don't from the nursery back then. But um, one of the things we really like to do with this wine, Ted Levantini, is actually from the Piedmont region originally. It's family, uh -huh. and. Um, they every year would do a banh yucata harvest. Oh, if you ever haven't had banh yucata, this is like the perfect wine for banh yucata. Yeah. You know, it's just it's basically a hot bath of garlic, butter, olive oil, and anchovies, totally. and then more mm -hmm. of each of those things. And it just slowly cooks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, dip bread and vegetables in it and eat it. And uh, the worst part is you smell it about three days afterwards. But, but everybody with you had does too, yeah, so you don't notice it. Yeah. <laughs> So, this is lovely. Um, the other question, I think James was asking if we have seen uh, renewed or more interest in Italian varieties. And I think on the winemaking side, there definitely is. I think um, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with um, with uh, a growing interest just in all varieties and flavors and stuff like that. I think today's consumer is is much um, you know more adventuresome in, in their willingness to try you know. Barbera, Ionica, Aldigo, you know, Campanino, Bello, Picou Blanc, and, and because of that, I think there's renewed interest in things like Barbera. We're fortunate that this is, you know, a 40 some year old vineyard, so the production is low and the quality is usually high. Um, it's a very versatile grape for us here in Bode. We do a dry rose as well as a, uh, as well as a, um, a little bit of harvest from this. this same vineyard as well, too. The city can carry very well about this wine. So. It's like you need to set a date for Bonnie Cloud and call us all. Yeah, you know, the, the only trick with it, I mean, if you smell like Bonnie Cloud for a couple of days, and you do in your house, it's going to smell for like a month. So well, I'll, have, I'll have to run the perfect time. Summertime. Time, it's so. a perfect summertime. It's a perfect summertime outdoor thing. <laughs> yes, it is. So we've done it, we've done it at the winery for some parents yeah. before. Um, um, and, uh, and it, uh, it, uh, we serve it outside, so. In my catering days, I was asked to uh, uh, cater to one of the vineyards, uh, wineries for um, Vines Wines, mm -hmm. the precursor to Zinfest. Yes. And Banyakada is what exactly what I did. We saw about 1,500 people 
go through and just enjoy. Yeah, about, yeah. Got great olive oil here. We've got all that good stuff, you know. All yeah. the vegetables, everything. Just great. Yeah, usually, you know, butter and olive oil and garlic. garlic. You know, you can't go wrong with those <laughs> combination of flavors. So, uh, you know, and one of the other things, one of the questions, how do we produce this one? It's eighteen dollars a bottle, and, and you know, we, uh, the funny thing is, is when we first started buying these grapes, we paid three to four times what the gal was paying for the grapes too, and, and you know, we were able to do it at a fair price, and everybody benefits from that. Uh, is it one hundred percent Barbera? I think this one I blended in just a, a touch of um, Tempranillo too. Tempranillo is a high tannin, um, low acid grape that kind of helps balance out the acidity and give it a little bit more texture in the middle of it. But, um, in some years it is 100% from there. And sometimes we use it in our bear, which is good for that. Gotcha. Gotcha. What was the RL time It's around 0.4%. I noticed a comment uh, Cameron about the packaging. Jesus arrived in great shape because we found a good way to do that. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for doing that. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. I was I was wondering how the uh, humble fog would arrive for everyone. Um, packaging it between the two lids was really, I think, a, a good way to uh, make sure it's in the right. Yep. The others are still here. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you guys I, for your I feedback. Had, uh, I had nothing to do with that, so we'll thank uh, Sydney <laughs> and Judy. <laughs> yeah. Lots of good, great minds. Run Cameron for helping coordinate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to put my hand around the corner. <laughs> I'm going to get another piece of cheese here. <laughs> so, uh, Piscolini Farm, not only do they make an incredible San Joaquin bowl, that was their first one, we carry a number of their cheeses in our shop. Uh, their bandage wrap cheddar, which is a cloth bound um, cheese that has a beautiful rind on it. They produce it in the same method as uh, uh, traditional English cheddars. The cloth binding helps to uh, let that cheese age beautifully. So that is in our shop as well, along with their uh, Italian style smoked scavorza, smoked over cherry wood. We have a lot of local wood. Um, good, good horseradish cheese, a variety of those things. So come in and try out this Bellini farm cheese. There's quite a, a wide range of deliciousness. Yeah, tomato. We all actually are in best every year as well, too, we yeah. have, which we have coming up next month our big, big wine festival. The Lodi here, we want some more of this. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on to our last and final wine tonight, which is um, it is kind of a uh, dramatic change of pace from where we're at here with the Barbera. But I think um, I think it's another fine example of uh, our sustainable program, and this is the Michael David Ink Block series, uh, 2012, I believe, to not, and uh, and this is. Uh, a wine that is also bears the, the certified green seal, and I think at this point it's worth you know complimenting Michael David for their efforts to um, promote our sustainable program. They, um, you know, 20 years ago they were mostly just a fruit stand out on Highway 12 here, and, and then they came up with the concept of Seven Deadly Zins, and they ran with that, and their organization has grown from there. Uh, but one of the things they did a few years back is, is they came in and, and decided to get financial bonuses to all growers that were doing the certification system in their, their uh, program that they were buying grapes from. Uh, and uh, basically gave them a financial incentive to go through the rigorous process of doing the paperwork. Because farmers don't like doing paperwork and getting audited to be certified. And now they, I think all their wines are moving to carrying the certified green seal. And, and um, just last year alone, or since that, uh, since uh, they've started giving bonuses, not only do they get bonuses, but a few other winers, including Global Vineyards uh, and Lang Twins, uh, and myself, um, there was, I think, one point, over $1.4 million have been ordered in their bonuses since we started that. They're a testament to that. I think they have nearly 80 some growers now, and um, their commitment to that has really helped uh, grow the program and increase the acreage. Um, this is definitely a go big kind of wine. So, uh, Cindy, why don't you tell us about the cheese to go with the Tanakh? <laughs> 
it is definitely a big wine. And honestly, it's a, a difficult wine to pair to cheese. So I called on the resources of our tasting room manager for the Michael David Little Tasting Room to uh, help me figure that one out. And their choice was the Seascape. And I want to point out to you that on the back side of your Seascape sample, there's a very thin layer that you need to peel off. This is not an edible rind. It is actually a polymer coating, that stretchy, plasticky kind of coating that is uh, applied to the sample rind cheese. However, the um, creamery that produces this is a wonderful creamery, Central Coast Creamery in Paso Robles. Uh, owner or cheesemaker Reggie Smith does an incredible job sourcing um, the milk from local dairies. He does not have his own animals. This is an artisan cheese, not a farmstead. The cheeses he makes are uh, of cow and goat at this time. Uh, he does have a cream line version of Gouda made of sheep that he does have produced in Holland and brought here. The ones he produces are all uh, either cow or sheep. This particular cheese is called Seascape. And it is a cheddar style uh, cheese, 60% cow's milk and 40% goat's milk. And it has a great smooth flavor, though a much drier texture than what you would you know, actually find in a traditional cheddar. I just love these cheeses. Central Coast Creamery does a great job. Yeah. I think it stands up pretty well to the wine um, without being overpowered. It says it's tough. This one. Pretty strong, big wine. Yeah, and I think um, I mean, this shows the range of styles of wines that are being made in I know too. I mean, this is a classic Michael David style of wine, and um, and uh, but it, I think it's it's executed well in the style they're trying to do. Uh, to not, you know, those are familiar with varieties from the south of France. Um, I think it's you know, probably pronounced it's from the Viren region where it's most notably grown there. It has, you know, found a second home in Uruguay, uh, and, uh, and you see a fair. I think I was just reading there's like 4,500 acres mm -hmm. grown in Uruguay at uh, I think it's known for its incredible uh, inky color and, and tannic, um, tannic uh, presence in the mouth. And I think you know some of the earlier versions that were made it can be very, um, uh, very. Uh, Unapproachable in to youth. I think the winemaking practices have evolved so that you know they can make these wines a little bit more approachable in their youth. Uh, I, you know, the, the practice of micro-oxygenation in winemaking actually began in the South of France, in this region where they're working with this variety and a few others that need that tool to help soften the wines. Uh, I was asked if blue cheese would go with this uh, wine. Um, Blue cheese is a tough pairing with wine, unless it's a sweet wine, uh, that's a much easier, you know, sweet, salty kind of uh, arrangement. This one, if you were to try pairing it with uh, blue cheese, I would go with something that is as strong as this is, to, so that one or the other is not overpowered. Perhaps a traditional Roquefort would be lovely. Um, we carried for a while there a Spanish Valley, I don't think we can get it anymore, the FDA has stepped in on that one. Spanish Valdeon was quite strong. It was a combination of goat and cow, and something that would hold its own in here. But um, you might have to pass on the blue. If you find a good blue to go with it, that might be fine. Let me know what it would be. This one I think is going to be tough on a red wine. Yeah. It, um, I, I mean, on a blue cheese. I yeah. apologize. On a blue cheese. I know what I have my colors all mixed up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the wine and food pairing requires something that's very fatty to oh, yeah. kind of counteract right? that presence. But that blue mold is. Tough on. Yes, it is. I mean, yeah, it is. It is much like a petit sirah, and uh, but they're having a lot of success with this wine. Um, it is also one of those varieties we're seeing in Lodi. I, they're kind of the experimental wines, or um, some of the larger wineries like to use them, call them their spice box wines. You know, a little bit goes a long ways in some of the blends. Um, one of the questions that popped up is Michael David, one of our largest wineries in. Uh, in um, Lodi, and, and the answer is no, but kind of yes. Um, <laughs> no, in that we have some very large, you know, uh, Woodridge wineries, obviously here in Lodi too, and they, they cost us you know, a lot more. Yeah, they do millions of cases. But Michael David's kind of the largest of the wineries, you know, producing Lodi Appalachian wines. They 
here, I think, you know, what goes around half a million cases now. And doing a fabulous job, you know, running from seven million cities up to their ink block series with the last couple of lash novels that are decadent names. <laughs> what I really liked about the flavor combination that I liked about Seascape to the Tanat, it reminded me of toast. Does that sound weird? I got this toast flavor, kind of that lightly burnt bread, kind of that combination. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Could be the yolk in the wine too, though. Because yeah. uh, I know I was asked the winemaker on this, and it's a fair bit of French oak goes on to this one. And maybe the cheese is bringing that toastiness out, because I'm, I'm getting a whole big toast reaction here. Yeah, and, and one of our first one of our commenters here said they're starting to love the Lodi, which are the whites, one of the reds, and, and I think the whites are kind of a hidden hidden secret in Lodi too. I mean, we tend to cast Lodi as a as a hidden secret or hidden jewel in general, but uh, most people think of Lodi as red. But there's some really delightful light whites here, and I, I think the neat thing on the white wines tonight too, and they're showing it's a style that's starting to emerge. Is they're not trying to be more than they are. It's just trying to take what you're tasting in the vineyard and kind of translating that into the bottle, getting it to the bottle fairly quickly and kind of capturing that freshness and, and lightness and, and not trying to make them like a, a you know, barrel like Chardonnay, so to speak. So anyways. I'm going to James the wine guy's house. He's preparing Marcone almonds and chorizo in that Yeah, I bet that would work well too. We have fabulous chorizo at our shop. Palacios, Spanish brand. Oh my gosh, and we sample it. Yeah. <laughs> Love our chorizo. I love chorizo eggs. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So all the Spanish wineries we have around, we're able to um, go through our Spanish cheeses. We've got uh, bocones and this wonderful Spanish chorizo, medrillo, big cake, all of those things to go to a wonderful Spanish picnic. One of our Spanish wineries. They all allow you to bring our goodies in. You know, one of, one of the last things, we're, we're about out of time here. I'd like to finish up on a, a final plug for um, for our Lodi Rules program. And, you know, we've made a lot of investment about our growers in us over the years in this program. And, and, you know, you're often asked, does it mean much to consumers? And, and, you know, I've had it on my wine labels now. It's going back from 2006. And, you know, rarely do I have a customer coming in saying I want wine because it has a, a Lodi Rules seal on it, too. But, um, you know, for us, we look at the program as having a lot of substance behind it. And there's a lot of products out in the market now that are claiming to be green products and things like that. And, um, you know, we take a lot of pride in making sure that ours is not, you know, just a play, but there's some real resources behind it. And uh, we would like, uh, <coughs> you know, for everyone to do their part to help get the word out on these wines, because the more interest we have in the consumer side of things and wines certified in this program, the greater interest our growers have in continuing to do it because there is a cost to it. You know, I said Michael David said, you know, they offer a financial incentive, but we also have to pay every year for the auditors to certify our vineyards and that could add up to several thousand dollars depending on the amount of acreage you're doing and it, it, it all adds up in these days. Um, what are the rough alcohol levels on the wines? I think um, the first the first one was twelve and a half. The um, the Peak Pool Blanc, the Sauvignon Blanc was 13.5, I think my Barbera is about 14.5, and, and the Michael David is around 15.5 and or 15.3, and no, we didn't structure that as a one percentage point gel, but that's the way they just, they just came out. So um, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening, and definitely like to thank Cindy for joining me here this evening and sharing these wonderful cheeses with you. I encourage you to come to Lodi, if not just for the wine, for the cheese. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Charles Palm for helping line you guys up, and, uh, and Jenny and Cameron for running all the technical stuff in the background. Oh, it's a pleasure Thanks. being invited. Invite me again. <laughs> if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us on any of the wines or any other things from the Lodi Rules program. We're always happy to uh, answer your questions and, and have you visit us here in Lodi. So. Thank you. Good night, everyone.